Praise the Lord. You turn that camera on. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just point it toward me, and I will take it from there. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, good morning. This is Pastor Bill Emmons, and uh, I do have a bit of a speaker blockage in front of me there, but we'll have to work with that today instead of rearranging everything. So, don't know why we didn't see that before when we were running our, our test. We'll minimize it. Praise God. Good to have you with us this morning. I see we have uh, Torsha, Chris, and Willie on there, uh, if, if you're all still on there. <laughs> and others, we, we always have more people on than what we see on the screen, uh, usually three to four times more people. So welcome, all of you, to our Sunday morning service. And as you may or may not know, we have, um, you don't have to start that yet. Okay. Um, we have uh, made some changes. We believe it was by the Lord's uh, direction. And, you know, we're always seeking the Lord uh, as far as His plan, His purposes, His direction for our lives, for our ministry. And uh, we feel like that the Lord spoke to us a number of weeks ago as we were nearing the end of this whole uh, COVID, if I dare I say, pandemic situation. <clears throat> anyway, um, the Lord had spoken to us that because uh, we were we had questioned Pastor Mary, and myself had questioned, Lord, what, we've been here forty four years. Why are we still here? We've had, uh, I mean, we've had big attendance we've had little attendance we've been up and down like a lot of churches have been but we always felt like that uh, at some point that there would be a change in direction for us and uh, not quitting pastoring or being a pastor see the bible says the callings of god are without repentance and god called me uh, first to teach the word the second thing he did was uh, put a healing anointing in me, on me. <laughs> and the third thing he did was call me to pastor. Well, I didn't have any of those in my plans. You know, when people talk about, well, that was the bottom of my list, they weren't even on my list. At the time that God called me into the ministry, I was an architectural designer, and um, I had no thoughts of ever being in the ministry. Um, but God spoke to me in an audible voice one day, uh, actually, one night I was at a meeting, and and there was a number of preachers there, and it was um, after Brother Copeland's 10-day uh, seminar back in 1973 in Long Beach. And we went uh, after the last night. We were invited over to Harbor Christian Center, which is one of the sponsoring ministries. And um, we're standing around fellowshipping, and, and uh, there was so many people there. Dennis Burke was there. Ed Dufresne was there. Of course, we were there. Uh, Kenneth and Gloria and others who I can't think of right now but there was a lot of people there and God began to move during the fellowship and minister to uh, Kenneth and Gloria about their ministry and I'm standing up against the opposite wall from them watching and observing and just kind of taking it all in and all of a sudden I heard somebody talking to me and I, I looked around to see who it was there was nobody around me and I heard an audible voice and God spoke to me about the, the Copeland's ministry and told me that, that we would have a ministry similar in the sense of what we preach and how we operate uh, to what they have if, we, if I would follow the Lord in the ministry. And, uh, of course, most of you know the story. That, that was not anything that I had planned on. I had a, when I was a kid growing up, the pastor's wife, every once in a while would come up to me and say one day you're going to be a pastor as a kid you just shrug it off and go on you know as a teenager when people started saying that more than just that pastor's wife um, other people would come and say you know God must have called you into the ministry or I think God's calling you into the ministry or you're going to be a pastor one day uh, you know I, I started rejecting that because I didn't feel like God had spoken to me about it and then uh, in 1973, God spoke to me in that audible voice and called me into the ministry. Of course, we didn't know anything about the ministry other than what I had seen growing up. I grew up in church, 
And uh, as far as a pastor goes, I'd never seen a happy pastor. They were always look like they were weighed down with the weight of the world and always having to deal with people and strife and offense in the church and just, you know, trying to raise money for projects and just a lot of stuff, you know. And even up when Pastor Mary and I got married, even our pastor uh, kind of was the same way. And, uh, you know, the, there was not an example of what I thought, you know, that I'd want to be a part of. And uh, so when God called me into the ministry, I, I, I crossed pastor off the list. And then uh, I, I didn't want to be, uh, well, an evangelist in, in one sense was uh, something that might have entered my thought at some point. But uh, I didn't want to be a missionary. <laughs> I didn't want to go uh, around the world and, and uh, go into the backwoods and the backwater areas and little villages and so forth that just did not seem something like I'd like to do. Uh, so I really didn't know what I was called to do except I was called to teach. And, oh, I didn't even know I was called to teach at that point. I was just called into the ministry. And then uh, it took about six months time and God spoke to me and he said, I put a teaching anointing on you. And uh, doors began to open uh, almost immediately. And I uh, began to teach home Bible studies, and then eventually we started traveling, uh, going from church to church and ministering. And, and God blessed us during that time, and we got hooked up with Ed Dufresne for a couple of years and ministered with him there at uh, Palos Verdes Faith Center. And uh, but pastoring was still not in my thinking. I, I didn't mind the thought of being an associate pastor, letting somebody else carry the burden. I'll just help them out, you know. But um, then uh, I came out to the Bible study that uh, actually it was the first night of a Bible study in a home up here in Northridge, California. And um, all I knew was I was one of four guys who was asked to rotate on a monthly basis. And uh, so I agreed to that because I always, at that point, looked for an opportunity to teach the Word. But the first night I was there, I turned out to be the first one instead of the last one on the list. And um, the gentleman who owned the home we were meeting in said, has God spoken to you about this group? And I said, no. Of course, being in a Pentecostal environment all my life, I, I I've had heard a lot of people prophesy and give words and so forth, and, and a lot of them never came into existence and I, I grew up you know at a young as a young man I began to realize that not everybody that said thus saith the Lord was hearing from the Lord and um, so it really took God dealing with me personally so when the gentleman said that I shrugged my shoulders as a no and I just kind of sloughed it off and then on my way home that night again uh, I was driving up, if any of you know Southern California, on the 405 freeway, there's an area called the Sepulveda Pass, where you drive from the San Fernando Valley up over a, a hill or a mountain down into the west side, uh, which is, you know, Culver City and, and uh, Santa Monica and Venice and so forth and on south. And we lived in Hawthorne or South Bay at the time. At the top of Sepulveda Pass, God spoke to me. Now, I was driving my little Volkswagen, and, and as big as I am, I could reach and touch every, every area of the car inside, you know. So I jumped, and I looked, and I'm feeling across the floor, and there's just somebody in my car, you know. And um, there was nobody there. And then I recognized the voice. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, that group that you just um, ministered with tonight, uh, that's not a home Bible study group. It's, he said, it's a new church, and you're the pastor. Well, in both instances, when God called me to preach and when God called me to pastor, I really did what you, we're always told, don't do this. But I kind of made a condition. And the first time I said, Lord, you got to talk to my wife about, you know, being in the ministry. It didn't take 24 hours. Literally the next morning she brought it up. And uh, that, I felt like a, is. Um, <laughs> It, it wouldn't have taken much to knock me off my chair onto the floor. It was, I, would, I would just bewildered that God would speak that fast and confirm it. And then that night when God spoke to me about pastoring, again, that was not on my list of things to do. And um, I said, well, Lord, there's, there's a number of people involved. First of all, my wife. Then you got the other three men that I'm supposed to be rotating with. And then you got Ed Dufresne, who was my pastor at the time. 
And I said, you know, God, I'll tell you what, I'll be glad to do whatever you want me to do. And that's really the attitude you've got to have, um, even if it's not something you think you want to do. And so I said, Lord, I'll do it. But here's the deal. You need to speak to all the people involved. And I'm not going to say a word to anybody. And you let them come to me. Well, that happened one by one. Each one contacted me. And the final one was my pastor, Ed Dufresne. And I was in the office uh, one day at the church. And I came out and was, wa- I'd been praying. And I came out and was walking down the hallway. And, and Ed came out of his office. And we kind of met face to face in the middle of the hallway. He stopped and looked at me and says, God called you to pastor, didn't he? Just out of the blue. Him and I have never discussed that. And uh, I looked at him, like, yeah, yeah. And uh, he, he said, is it that group out in the valley? I said, yeah. He said, what are you going to do about it? I looked at him, I said, I guess I'm going to pastor. <laughs> so that was the beginning. And uh, from that point forward, we uh, were involved out here in the San Fernando Valley. And uh, the church began, and July 3rd was our first, first official service. So this Sunday today marks the end of uh, in the end in the sense of the time frame 44 years it marks the end of the 44th year that we've been pastoring this church and uh, we are now moving into a new phase of ministry most of you know this we've sent letters out to anybody we had addresses for uh, to let you know what's going on there is a transition taking place we were already going to move Pastor Mary and I had, had already settled in our hearts that we needed to move from where we are. And we were looking locally, like Santa Clarita or something, so we'd still be close to the church. But we already had it in our hearts to move. And uh, uh, we didn't know where that was going to happen, but it just seemed like nothing was working. With it. No house was opening up for us, and uh, we, we had certain things we needed in a house, and that just wasn't happening. And, uh, and the prices, even in Santa Clarita, were going, you know, skyrocketing. Here in Southern California, it's gotten ridiculous. So, you know, we just kept looking and praying. And um, then, oh, probably four or five years ago, we were praying about our place here in the San Fernando Valley in Southern California. We we're praying about the church, praying about what our part is, what we're called to do, what our future might be. And somebody that we never had met before, uh, we were sitting, it was at a uh, Southwest Believers Convention, we were sitting across the street during the lunch break in the, I think it was the Omni Hotel down in the lobby. We had bought a couple of sandwiches and Pastor Mary and I were sitting in the lounge area relaxing and this person walks up to us and they sat down and started talking and pretty soon they stopped and looked at us and said, really believe God's got a, a, a got a word from the Lord for you. He said, uh, God has you where you're supposed to be for a purpose. And that was it. And that really, at that point in time, that was an answer to what we were asking. Are we supposed to continue with where we are, or are we supposed to make a change? And so then, um, oh, I'm, I'm guessing a couple of years ago, uh, we were once again. See, the Lord was in our, in our spirits. We knew there was a change coming. We didn't know what it was. And a lot of you don't know what the change is in your life that uh, God is bringing to you. And uh, so we were praying again. And the Lord spoke to Pastor Mary and said, um, I need you here. The people need you. And uh, so we felt, okay, well, we're, we're, we're committed. We, we made a commitment to the Lord. We'll stay there until Jesus comes, if that's what we're supposed to do. And so we've been committed the whole time, been faithful. Have, we have not missed a service any time in 44 years. We've been on vacation. We've had people fill in for us. But as far as, uh, you know, because we're sick or because we just didn't feel like getting up and going, you know, what a pastor? What kind of pastor would that be? Well, I don't feel like going to church today. I'm going to let my associate pastor take it. You know, we have not done that. We have not missed a service in 44 years, and uh, and that's not a pride thing. That's just a fact, because we've been committed. 
But uh, during this past year and a half with the COVID, we, we continued to seek the Lord as far as our direction goes. And I, I, have, a, I have big vision. And I, I always had seen, you know, a big church uh, facility and, and um, you know, thousands of people attending and having our Bible school, school of ministry, our Christian school and everything functioning on a big campus. Uh, and we've had parts of that over the years. But um, during the end, this past couple of months of this COVID deal, um, the Lord began to deal with us. And Pastor Mary came to me and uh, said that something she felt the Lord had spoken to her. And um, I just listened and, and, you know, as I always do, when somebody comes to me and says, God said, you know, well, I take it seriously and I pray about it. And as I said, not everybody that says God said or thus saith the Lord necessarily has heard from God. So I always take it to prayer. And I know some people over the years have thought, well, pastor doesn't listen to us. He doesn't care. He doesn't, you know. No, I listen to everything people say and I take it to God in prayer. And there's a lot of stuff people have said that wasn't God. And then there have been things that was God. And I've taken that to heart. I've taken action. Well, when Pastor Mary shared that with me, I took it to prayer. Uh, the next day and I said Lord you know what what about this is, is it time uh, for the change that we've always felt was going to happen uh, to make a transition and I mean God just dropped it like that right into my heart there we go <laughs> first one didn't work too well uh, dropped it into my heart and said that was me and yes it's time you stayed to the point I needed you to stay and now it's time for you to make a transition. And we still didn't know for sure what the transition was, and we're still not completely clear on that. We just have simple direction, like Abraham, you know, go, God says, get up and take your family and go where I show you to go. He didn't even know where that was. It was, he'd, he'd journey all day long, and God was, he'd stop and make a camp. And it wasn't until he got to where God had planned for him to be that God would say, this is the place. So we're making that transition right now. Um, we 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 prayed about every everything that's been going on, and and uh, you know when you have more people watching online that are still supporting the ministry, tithes and offerings and so forth, but they're not coming to the live services, and, and a lot of it's out of fear because we've been listening too much to the news and what the government has told us and so forth. Um, you know we, that really as a pastor. You're not, you're not called, you, I'm not sure how to explain it. When, when COVID first started in March a year ago and things got shut down, we didn't shut down our services. And we told people, you know, you can come, you can sit six feet or 10 feet away or whatever you want to do. You can come wearing a hazmat suit if you want. We don't care. But the, that personal touch, that personal eyeball to eyeball contact uh, is important. And so... Uh, there was a number of months, it was just Pastor Mary and I in there. The doors were open, we preached, I put out the signs every day, and we did everything we normally do. And one day I got a phone call, and uh, this lady that um, we knew, you know, had been part of our church already, uh, she said, uh, Pastor, I know you're live streaming, but can I come to the service? Can I, can I come and sit in? And I said, absolutely. We, I said, we've never shut the door. Anybody that wanted to come could. And she came, and, and before it was done, we had about a half a dozen people that were attending uh, for a period of time during the, the COVID after, after a few months had gone by. And, um, and I'm, I'm still praying about this whole thing. Lord, I, I, is this what you said? Uh, this is what you were talking about when you said the people need you. And the Lord spoke to me and said, yes, this is, I have prepared you for this time for these people. And he said, the people need a pastor, and you're here when many others aren't. And, uh, and then I really didn't think much beyond that. But when the Lord spoke this word to Pastor Mary and then confirmed it to me, uh, I realized that that time now had ended, where God said, I need you there, and I need you for the people because they need you there. And because uh, when you come in Sunday morning, there's three people there, and the rest are all at home. You know, 90% of your congregation is at home watching online. 
Um, it's like, okay, Lord, is this ever going to be over? And so, I, you know, again, the Lord uh, dealt with me and said, all right, it's time for a transition, not, not a stopping. And the letter that those of you that are our partners or CFC members, uh, even some of you who aren't, I've, I've sent out to people on our mailing list, letting them know what's going on. We are making a transition. Uh, we'll be taking a trip uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, in, um, in July, about the 10th, I think, or so. Um, we had already planned on moving, so we were already planning our packing and everything. We're, we got boxes everywhere. We've been cleaning out the garage. Uh, do, do you know what 50 years of stuff is? Pa Pastor Mary and I had celebrated our 50th anniversary last month. Uh, or actually, I guess we're still in June, so it was this month. No, in May, that's right. She'll remind me. Um, and we have 50 years of stuff. <laughs> Our garage was full. I mean, wall to wall, floor to ceiling, two car garage packed. And so we've been going through all that. I have actually lost weight. I've lost about five pounds. And I'm building up strength and endurance. But why? Picking up heavy boxes full of books or papers. And we have, we have filled up three or four of the big trash bins uh, here in our complex with nothing but trash. Stuff we just forgot about. Put them in boxes and left them and go, uh, going through boxes finding out it was all trash. And, uh, and we've been selling a lot of things, praise God. People want what we got, so we let them buy it. <laughs> so it's been quite an experience and we're, we're whittling things down. We're about the end of that part of it uh, this week. And we've, we've got a truck coming and we're going to be loading up, um, not this coming week, but the following week. Um, and we're going to head on out. And uh, like I said, we're, we're heading to Tulsa. And we believe that God has something there for us to do. Uh, we don't know how long we're going to be. And I'm not saying this is permanent. Uh, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, we're, we're never going to be back here to this area. We just have to take this trip and see what our next step is. And so we're going to do that. We're going to minister, uh, continue, we're going to continue pastoring. Uh, everybody that's part of this congregation or wants to be, we will continue to pastor or shepherd you. We will be available by phone. Most of you have our phone numbers. Uh, and if you don't, if you're part of this church or you want to be, uh, send us an email. We'll give you our number to contact us. We'll give you our email so you can contact us. You can message us on Messenger. Uh, I mean, there's all, all kind of ways to communicate with us. So we're not going to leave you alone. We're, we're just going to find out what our, our, next, our next job is here, our next uh, assignment. Uh, but we're not... See, I'm a pastor because the callings of God are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind. So I'm a pastor, I am a teacher, and I have a healing anointing. And we're going to operate in that. And uh, so once you, I, I'm asking for your prayers. I'm asking for your faith. And uh, when, when we kind of find out what our next step is, uh, we're going to let everybody know, know what to expect. The things that we feel so far, we're going to expand our social media presence. I checked on uh, our Tuesday night Bible study on one social media platform alone, we had, as of last night, we had over 3,400, 3,400 views. And if you combine all the social media platforms that we're operating on, uh, obviously the numbers go up. So we're ministering to more people on social media and literally around the world than we ever have in our 44 years of pastoring. Uh, we've never ministered to that many people at one time. So obviously God's doing something and, I, and we've heard from a lot of pastors that they're seeing the same things. And um, a lot of pastors are making uh, changes and transitions to their ministries. So we feel like we're, we're doing the right thing, going the right direction. But we want to let our congregation know we're not going to uh, neglect you. We're not going to ignore you and, and uh, just forget you and go on. Uh, we're still available. And don't hesitate to call. I got a call from somebody this week. I answered the phone and almost immediately, uh, which I haven't done much of that in the past years. I let them leave their message and find out what they want before I answer them back. You never know what people are calling for. Um, but we're going to be more attentive to our congregation so that you don't feel neglected. 
Uh, we won't be having in-person services at this point. We, we don't know yet what the future holds, but we, we're not going to be doing that temporarily. We'll be ministering online like we are this morning. And um, so we just wanted to let you know, kind of fill you in on what's going on. And uh, like I said, we now this Sunday is the, uh, the end of, a, of the 44th year of pastoring this congregation. And, um, but that doesn't mean we're stopping. We're just making some changes and transitions here. I did get an offer this week that I wanted to share with you. Uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't committed to anything on this, uh, but we got, I got an email from a gentleman that heads up a uh, television network, uh, not one of your secular TVs, but a Christian uh, network. And uh, somehow he had heard me teaching, ministering, and uh, he made an offer and said that for $50, I can do a 30-minute program. And uh, I'd never heard of it being that affordable, but it would be worldwide. It would be on, uh, and I don't have the, the details in front of me right now, but multiple networks, multiple TV stations, uh, and on radio and on social media. Uh, and they would do all that, and I just pay the $50 per half hour program. So at this point, we're not committing to uh, more expenditures. Uh, we're not going to try and increase our budget at this point. But we'll let you know if, if we feel like that's what God wants us to do. Uh, that will be worldwide, that will be on television and on radio. And uh, that's, that's a tremendous investment. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, we're, going, we're looking at, and I think as we settle in this next step, when we get moved into our house and I have a studio, I'm actually going to set up a studio that's be set up permanently, uh, where I won't have to set up and tear down, set up and tear down. Um, we're, uh, I'm looking at doing a 15-minute segment every day. Uh, I, I appreciate your input. Uh, I'm considering either doing it morning uh, or like around the noontime, like lunchtime, where you, you take your lunch break and, and you, you turn us on maybe like 12, 15, 12, 30, something like that, and we'll give you a 15 minute uh, shot in the arm spiritually. So that's one of the things that we're feeling impressed. Uh, I want to expand my social or my um, political commentary on my. Facebook page and, and probably other pages uh, regarding uh, a biblical perspective of the politics and things that are happening in this country particularly. A lot of things are not being talked about that I feel I have a uh, biblical perspective on. I've shared a little bit and we're going to increase that. And then I, as you most of you know, I've been working on a number of books and I'm going to use some of this time to uh, get those ready to go to the publisher. And I believe God's gonna provide the money. Each one is gonna cost me $4,500. But as Pastor Mary and I both have realized, when God says do it, it doesn't cost us anything. God provides the funds. And so we feel like we may be at that point where that it's time for that to happen. So when we ask, when we ask you to pray for us, I'm absolutely serious. Please pray. <laughs> All right, now, I know I've spent 45, almost 45 minutes here, but I felt it was important for you to hear these things and hear it from us and not w from somebody else's idea or thoughts or what they imagine is going on. Now you know what's going on. Amen? All right. Um, I want to uh, spend the next 15 minutes sharing with you something I began last week. Uh, we are talking about Jehovah Gamola, the names of God. Yeah, you can go ahead and start that. Uh, we're starting Instagram right now. Instagram only gives you an hour, and then they delete it. Uh, so we're learning about Instagram. We're on Instagram now. Welcome all you folks that are on Instagram. Good to have you with us this morning. Um, last week I, I shared with you, we've been doing the names of God for the last few weeks. I think we're in, this is session number 12. Um, and this, the scripture in uh, the 91st Psalm, uh, where it says, um, uh, because I have set my love upon him, therefore he will deliver me. But it goes on then and says, 
he will set me on high because I know and understand his name and have a personal knowledge of his mercy, love, kindness. I trust and rely on him because I trust and rely on him. There's, there's two statements that are very important there. The first statement on that is, um, let's see, because I have set my love upon him, therefore he will deliver me. So one, that first part is about deliverance. But the second part says, he will set me on high. That's, that's more than deliverance. That's putting you on top of the situation in victory. And why? He says, he will set me on high because I know and understand his name. Well, God doesn't have just one name. God is not God's name. We call him God. But Jehovah, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, um, you know, Elohim, uh, and we've been going through these names. And this, this one this morning, we started last week, Jehovah Gamola. And I may be totally slaughtering the pronunciation on that. Um, but the, the easy translation of that is our God who recompenses and restores. That's, that's condensing all the things in the translation from the Hebrew language. Uh, you get two main things out of that. Recompense and restoration. Recompense deals with pay and payback. And the other one is restoration, restoring what you've lost or what's been stolen from you. Now, I got to be honest with you, and I think a lot of us are in the same boat, so to speak, that in, in all our years of ministry since 1973, so we're, what, 48 going on our 49th year of ministry. Um, is that right, 49th year? I guess it is, yeah, because we've been, okay. Just got to keep the numbers. Um, we have had uh, opportunities like everybody where the devil's tried to steal from us, and at some points it seems like he was successful, and he's stolen from us. He's stolen finances from us. He's stolen projects from us. He's stolen people that God called and anointed to be part of our ministry. And all of a sudden, they up and leave without any explanation. N not even uh, pastor, you know, I believe God's called me or told me or whatever. Just disappear. No word, no nothing. So we, we know, and I've talked to pastors over the years, we've all gone through the same things. And it's not much different than things you've gone through, uh, where people have left your fellowship as you know on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You had good relationships, all of a sudden they don't want to talk to you anymore, fellowship with you anymore. Could be family, could be friends. Uh, everybody's experienced where where uh, you know things have been stolen from you in the material realm uh, or other areas, but. We need to understand that one of the names of God reveals a very powerful facet of the nature of God. That he is the God who repays, the God who restores. And then recompense also includes um, pay for, uh, for example, you, you work a job and you get a paycheck. That's recompense. You get paid for the work you do. Well, God doesn't ignore the work you do for the kingdom of God. And God hasn't ignored the work we have done in the kingdom of God. In the last few weeks, we've gotten more testimonies. I've been just so blessed to hear from people who have told me the story of, of you know, even years ago, 40 years ago, where I ministered and something I said set them free or something that we preached and ministered to got the whole family saved and and that's been going on right up until the present time and, and getting current testimonies. And it's very encouraging to hear those testimonies. So if any of you have been blessed by this ministry, I want to hear from you. <laughs> that encourages me. But uh, And you can send it to my email, w-e-m-m-o-n-s-0-1 at gmail.com. But um, we, I'm just looking to see who's watching this morning. I see you guys. I see you. <laughs> um, when I, when I started studying this name of God, it really ministered to me that, that God was going to, that I had the promise, because it's the nature of God, that I have the promise that God's going to restore what I've lost through my wrong actions. And you know, we, none of us perfect. And we've all made wrong choices. We've all made wrong decisions. And praise God, God forgives us. 
If it involves sin, the Bible says if we confess our sin, God's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we, we go through that process. And when we miss the mark, whatever it might be, we finally have to recognize, you know, God, I missed it. And, uh, you know, I repent. And uh, if, if for nothing more than missing the mark and not hearing your voice, God, just doing something out of the flesh or out of what I thought I needed to do. Um, but God restores. He restores what we've lost, what the devil has stolen. Any, anything that involves loss in your life, God is the restorer. And, and some of you, it's family, it's relationships. Some of you, it's, it's uh, careers, it's employment, uh, financial investments. Uh, you know, I, I've made a lot of good investments over the years, but I've also made a few bad ones. And, and they weren't bad at the time, but they turned out bad in the end. And, uh, you know, I, had, <laughs> I remember when God spoke to me, I was in prayer one morning, God said, I want you to start buying gold and silver. Yeah, like I have the kind of money to buy gold and silver. Well, when God spoke to me about that, silver was $5 an ounce, gold was $500 an ounce. And so in obedience to the Lord, I began to buy the silver coins and gold coins. The gold, I had to buy smaller quantities. Silver, you know, was fairly affordable. Well, if you know anything about silver and gold right now, uh, last time I checked, silver was uh, about 26 27 dollars an ounce and gold I think is uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of eighteen hundred dollars an ounce right now and uh, so that was a wise decision and it was God there came a day when God said sell and I, I, I took all my silver all the gold everything I went down to the coin dealer and uh, I said I want to liquidate all this and he says man you know how to time the market don't you I said why he said today is the top of the market it's highest it's ever been and and i didn't know that i wasn't paying attention i just would buy it and put it away and so god blessed us in that there's been times when i would buy a car and, and uh, have it fixed up like a corvette or something and uh you know put a couple thousand two three thousand into it and sell it for seven or eight thousand and uh god blessed me with those so what i'm saying is there's there's times when we have heard God and we've succeeded. Then there's times we thought we heard God, but because we were under pressure, maybe it wasn't God. But God will restore. No matter what the reason is, if you will trust him as Jehovah Gamola, he is the God who restores. What about all the volunteer time you put into your church? What about all the good things you've done? I know there's a lot of you out there that have been part of our church that have blessed us personally as your pastors. That doesn't go unnoticed by God. That goes on account. And, and as you have given your, of your time and your finances into our lives and into this ministry, God is the one who pays you back. And it's not just, if we, if we can use it in dollar equivalents, it's not dollar for dollar. It's good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That God will cause it because you're giving to bless us but it also, because we're in the ministry, it blesses the work of God. So there's a multiplication factor that takes place. And the Bible says it will come back. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. So I want to encourage every one of you that's ever supported this ministry, uh, not just to continue supporting, but to realize that God wants to, and if I can use this term, God wants to pay you or pay you back. But it's with... Uh, dividends galore amen good measure pressed down shaking the running over but here's the the other part i want to emphasize in these last few minutes that god is the god of restoration and it all comes under that same name of god he restores what you've lost he restores what the devil's stolen he's restored what's messed up because of bad choices you've made and wrong choices or other people's actions in your life. He is the God of restoration. And I'm telling you, we've been watching God these last few weeks. And we, as we committed to this, Pastor Mary looked at me and when we first made the commitment, she says, this will be the easiest move we've ever made. We haven't moved in 12 years. So <laughs> now it's a big deal to us. But it, it was, well, there was a point 
we moved every, oh, maybe two, three, four years. And trying to better, you know, get into a better neighborhood, better house, whatever it might be. Of course, as our kids were growing, we had to move into bigger facilities, bigger homes, because we, had, we were raising five kids, you know, and they were growing, getting bigger, and so forth. But there's been times when we felt like the devil stole from us, stole a house from us, and uh, the finances to be able to afford a certain level of living. But you know what? We've been watching God do things. This, the things I mentioned, we put up a number of things uh, for sale. Things that, you know, we'd look at and think, you know, why would somebody want to buy that? And God would send us somebody that that's exactly what they've been looking for. And it's just been amazing to watch. And so we're watching restoration in progress in our lives and in this ministry right now. We're watching God not only take care of us, but restore to us the things the devil has stolen. And it's just, it's been such a blessing to see that. I want to read Joel here. Uh, I know we're, we're pushing time here. Mary, you got a time on, on Instagram. You know where we are on that, right? Okay, got plenty of time. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do here on Facebook, I'm going to keep on going until we have to shut down Instagram. So you're going to get some extra time. Uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 21 through 29, King James translation. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former and, uh, rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore, now listen to this verse, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, which I allowed, and you have to, yeah, again, you got to go back. I've been saying this for 44 years, or 48 years. There's a causative permissive verb that's used in the Bible. And it simply says, I was caused to allow. And, and, and every time you read a scripture like this, where it says, uh, for example, um, <clears throat> my great army, which I sent among you. Well, God doesn't send death and destruction among us. He's not the God of death and destruction. He's not the author of it. Jesus gave us a dividing line in John 10, 10. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God is not a thief. If it's stealing, killing, or destroying, it is not God. Now, I've heard a lot of Christians, a lot of preachers say, well, you know, God brought this COVID on us. Uh, he's, he's trying to wake up the church. No, God didn't do this. Now, in the midst of something the devil's doing, God can move in us and wake us up, but God didn't do it. God don't need to use the devil. All right, so here's the translation uh, the way it ought to be, and you could write this in your margin or between the lines if you can write that small. Uh, it, I will restore to you the years the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I uh, sent among you. It should read this way. This, the great army which I allowed to be sent among you. Every time Israel had turned their back on God, had turned to foreign gods, had, had quit worshiping God in, in spirit and truth, where they got into religion, the, the devil would come in because they opened the door. Sin and evil opens the door for the devil to come in. And so the devil would come in and bring death and destruction upon Israel. It, it was not God destroying his own people. He, had, he made a covenant with them. But in the covenant, there's a blessing and a cursing. The blessing is when you do the things God has said, the curse comes not because God curses us, but it comes out of disobedience, rebellion, sin. When we, when we go against the things of God, we open the door to the devil to come in, not God. So he says he is allowed, or he allowed that to happen. Verse 26, And he shall eat in, uh, plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God. He's talking about Israel here. 
and uh, that that um, uh, let me say and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed now listen he's still talking here verse 28 and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and the handmaidens in those days I will pour out my spirit where else have you heard that how about the book of Acts <laughs> when Peter stands up and says this is that which the prophet Joel spoke about. We, we get a link from the Old Testament right into the New Testament on the day of Pentecost. And God wasn't just talking about the natural things that are mentioned here. He was talking on a spiritual level as well. Remember the, the Word of God has different levels of revelation. There's the reader level, you know, where you read, a, read it like a book. It's a storybook. And you read the stories. That's one level. That's where a lot of people are in the world. And then there's the next level where you read it as a spiritual book and you begin to see and, and understand things as they relate to us spiritually. And then there's a third level, which is revelation. Uh, like Peter had when Jesus said, uh, who do men say that I am? He says, some say you're this or that. He said, but Peter, who do you say that I am? And, and just like that, he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He says, Peter, you're blessed because of that. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my Father in heaven revealed it to you. That's revelation knowledge, epinosis. It goes beyond seeing and hearing and feeling and experiencing. It came by the Spirit of God. And Jesus said, that's what I'm going to build my church on. He didn't say, I'm going to build it on you, Peter. I'm going to build it on that kind of revelation that you just got. Every time we get a revelation of God, we grow, we increase, we're built up. That's how you as, a ch as the church grow, amen? Then there's another level of revelation that almost nobody ever talks about. It's the prophetic revelation. And every scripture we read has a prophetic element to it. And when you're studying it prophetically with that mindset, you begin to see it in everything you read. It's, it's there because it all was meant to reveal God's plan for the church and the God's plan for his people, and what God had promised to do. So there's various levels of revelation. So when we read this in Joel, it sounds like God's just talking to Israel. But Peter says, no, no, it's us, because we are the, the, we are the people of God. We are the covenant people. All right, so let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 14, King James Translation. Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose. Now this is the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was poured out upon the 120 in the upper room. And they began to speak in tongues. They were all filled with the Spirit, and began to speak in tongues. He says, these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. <clears throat> but this is that. I like to highlight that. I did it in my notes. Oh, man, I apologize to everybody. I forgot to send my notes out. I, I apologize. Um, I'll do that today. I'll send, it, I'll send it afterwards so you've got them. But most of my notes are part of last week's notes. So if you got last week's, you, you, you'll be able to do all right. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. Now, when it was spoken by Joel, that wasn't anywhere beginning to be near the last days. There was a prophetic element there about the end times. But people didn't see it. Most of them didn't know it. But Peter got it. He, that was the prophetic to Israel. It was about where they were and where they're headed. But it was more than that. It was about God's covenant people which we are, and what the future holds for us. Amen? All right, so he goes on here. 
It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. I've been saying this for a number of years. I, I'm, I must be right in that middle age in between because I, I see both visions and, and I get dreams. And there's times I wake up and the dream's been so clear and so accurate. And I know God has revealed something to me. But there's other times I have a vision. I see things and I don't always see an open vision. There's different kinds of vision, as you know. Uh, an open vision is where you, you're looking with your eyes and you're seeing something and everything that is there in the natural kind of disappears. And it's almost like you, you, a movie screen, you know, you're watching something else. And uh, you, you have an open vision. And I've experienced that and do from time to time. But then there's other aspects of vision where you see it inside. You see it in your spirit. And, and it, it goes off in you and it's so big. Um, and I, I, can, I can probably sit and tell you a number of instances. Uh, during these past few weeks, I've been having a few of these. And uh, I, I, <laughs> I can't tell you all of them. Uh, and I have to sit and wait uh, to judge to make sure that what I'm seeing is God. You don't just jump and run at the first thing that you see or hear that you think is God, even when you hear a voice. You have to wait on the Lord. You have to wait on the Holy Spirit. And so I, I've, been, I've been seeing visions, and they're not big, massive visions worldwide, you know, impact kind of stuff. It's, it's visions uh, sometimes related to your own personal life. Uh, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's rel excuse me, <coughs> relatives or maybe neighbors around you. It may be related to people you work with or people at your church. But don't just, you know, run down to the church next Sunday morning and start prophesying over somebody and say, well, I got this vision and God showed me. You know, you, you better make sure and wait on the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you that that was God. Because the devil wants to give you dreams and visions too. And most of you have had those. So we have to be able to discern the difference between what the devil is show, uh, showing us and what the Spirit of God is revealing to us. Amen? Amen? All right. So on verse 18, On my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. This outpouring, I'm just reading from my notes here, was our self-existent almighty God of recompense and restoration ministering to the church. Not just the church in the book of Acts. Because that revelation is still ministered to us by the Holy Spirit. We are called to have the same experience that the, the believers had on the day of Pentecost. God told them, don't even go out and witness and don't preach, don't do nothing until you're endued with power from on high. So we have a revelation right there that when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're endued or empowered with the power of God. So he tells them, go wait in Jerusalem. There, there's a time we got to wait on the Holy Ghost, not just jump and run because we think we got a vision or a word or a dream or whatever it might be. There's people that... Every time they make a decision, well, God showed me, God told me, God. And, and, you know, it gets to the point after a while, it's like, you know, God must occupy all his time with that person. You know, they, they keep them real busy. But then you see some of the decisions people like that make, and you realize that, wait a minute, if that's God, how come this? You know, uh, I, I'm very slow to say God told me, or the Lord spoke to me, or the Holy Spirit told me. I, I, I like to use this term. I felt impressed. Now that, and I say it that way because until I have it confirmed in me that the, the thought or the vision of the dream that I've had was by the Spirit of God, I don't want to blame God for something that was just me. Uh, I don't want to blame God for something that I, I got because I was in a mood one day and or I had uh, a good day, and, and uh, you know, yesterday, for example, uh, we were down at the church, and and um, one of our pianos we had we uh, have had for years, uh, really nice uh, uh, Yamaha 
electric grand piano. And boy, sound great. And it wasn't a digital, it was really a piano with strings and keys and hammers and everything. And then God blessed us about a year and a half, two years ago with a baby grand after the Lord spoke to me one Sunday morning and said to believe him for it. And that spirit of faith hit me. 30 days later, we had it sitting in our church. But until then, we had this uh, Yamaha electric grand piano. And uh, the, we've had it sitting in storage ever since then. And uh, the Lord said, sell that. You're not using it. Get it out there being, being a blessing to somebody instead of just sitting in storage, not blessing anybody. And so a young man came down to look at it yesterday and we, we took it out of storage and we set it up. I forgot how heavy that sucker was, man. It, three guys and we're, we're muscling this thing around, you know, two pieces I have to put them together and, and it looks like a, a small uh, size baby grand, except for travel, you know, for bands and stuff. So we put it together and we, he gets it working, plugged in, everything's working. And he starts playing and just going up and down the keyboard and, and it's sounding great. And then uh, we had another uh, 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 lady and her, and her son, her adult son showed up and they get to talking and they played the piano and, and they were taking turns. We went over to the baby grand, the, the, the regular baby grand that God gave us recent, you know, last couple of years. And they started playing there and and this guy, man, he's just going, he's singing gospel songs. And, and, and I'll tell you what, I got emotional. It, it got, I, I believe by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was reminding me how powerful music is in the Christian walk. And it moves us, it moves our emotions. And, and I got to a point, I, I couldn't talk. I was just sitting there, tears were trying to well up. Uh, you know, oh, you're not going to cry now. We're not in church, you know, and. And so I'm sitting there, and I got my back to Mary. She can't see me, and, and uh, I'm just sitting there thinking, oh, what a blessing, man. I'm worshiping the Lord. And they're just playing on the piano, playing the, you know, believer's songs. And, and, uh, and the, the young man turned out he was a worship leader in his church, and he attends a Word of Faith church. Uh, was it out in Ontario or something like that? Or? Uh, no, Palm Springs. Palm Springs. Oh, Palm Springs. <laughs> And uh, they teach the word out there, the word of faith, and and he's been wanting to pick up one of these pianos. They're very expensive uh, pianos, and the Lord told me what to ask for it to, to be a blessing. And uh, he ended up buying this piano, and and he was just like a little kid. He's been wanting to get one of these for years, and and now he was able to get one. And I'm sure he took it home and set it up and started playing right away. I know I would, you know, but. What, what was happening? A number of things were going on there. Uh, God was doing prophetic things through us, not only for us, but for others. Um, God was restoring, because the, 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 the man that got the piano had had an earlier version of that, and had always missed it when he got rid of it and wanted to get another one. So God was restoring to him uh, something he had let go of. And God was restoring to us by allowing us to sell it and put that money to work in the ministry. And so a number of things were going on. And, and what I saw yesterday was such a beautiful experience. Pastor Mary and I both were sitting there just basking in the glory of the Lord. And, and here we are, people are coming to buy stuff that we were selling. Uh, and, and I'll be honest with you, we kind of turned it into a uh, com combination office sale, garage sale. We took a lot of the stuff as we've been going through our garage, things that we knew were valuable to somebody. We didn't want to just throw them away. And we took them down to the church and, and put them along with the things from the church that we knew we weren't going to need anymore or we needed to get rid of. And, uh, and God's been bringing people in. It always seemed like the right person would show up for, the, for a particular item and, and they would be so happy and so blessed. And and we've been able to bless a lot of people. And everybody that bought something, we gave them something. We, we just wanted to bless people. Now, I, I've said all that because what we're seeing is Jehovah Gamola, the God of restoration, the God of recompense in action. We're seeing it firsthand. And, and I'm telling you, it's just such a blessing. It's, it's just something that... Uh, when you begin to experience, you just sit back and 
and, and just you know watch God do things. And that's what's been happening. So we praise God for that. Matthew 28, verse 16. How are we doing on time for the uh, Instagram? I think you have 30 left. 30 still? Mm -hmm. Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus... How much? 27. Okay. Uh, into a... Uh, <clears throat> to a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, therefore, you go. He didn't say, I got all this power, dominion, and authority, which is really what it should be saying there. And then then say, and I'm going to go do this, you know. No. He said, I got it back. But the Bible declares we died in him when he died. We were buried with him when he was buried and we were raised in him when he was raised up and we were seated with him in heavenly places when he was seated in heavenly places we were in him now what does that mean all that happened all that he got we got not when you got born again but 2000 years ago when it happened you were already in him hallelujah when he says, and the, and the Bible calls, the New Testament calls the church the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Good morning, Mary. We have Mary, Tarsha, Anita. Um, uh, I saw Karina, praise God, Willie, Chris. Praise God, good crew this morning. When we become a Christian, we get born again, not just joining a church. You become part of the body of Christ. You are engrafted into him. He's the head. We're the body. Now, sometimes we want to be the mouthpiece, but maybe that's not the part that God called you to be. You know, in a body, you need to have good toes. You need to have good heels. You need to have good foot uh, structure. If you got bad feet, the whole body has a problem. Uh, some people are called to be knees or joints or, or you know, hands, ears, eyes, voice. And, that, and that's the way the Apostle Paul talks about the body of Christ in those kinds of terms. We're not all called to be the mouthpiece, but we are all part of the body. I think sometimes part of the pe problem people have is they don't know what their part is in the body. I'm not talking just in the local church. There's a lot of people that don't know where their place is in the local church. And there's a whole lot of people more than that that are not in their place in the local church because they're not in the local church. They may attend church, but they're, and I can tell you this from 44 years of pastoral experience, there's a whole lot of people that come and get and never give, never participate, never become a part, never take their place in the local body. They just come and preach me a good message, preach me a faith message, preach me something that'll build me up. Don't talk about nothing else. Just, you know, but then they never become a part of ministering to people. They never become a part of the work of God. And, and that's sad. And it's sad for us as pastors to see that because we know that their lives are not developing. But we also need to know where we are spiritually. What is my place in the body of Christ, in, in, in Jesus? Where am I? And it's not really as important to know the technical term of where you are it is important to know that you are in him and you have a job to do as part of his body as well as a job to do as part of the body in general the church all right i don't mean running around from church to church i'm talking about in your local church now just because we're not having in-person services right now doesn't mean that you don't have a part yeah one of the biggest things you can do is pray and intercede for us and for the other people that are part of this body. Um, if you're not attending a church or you can't like, we do have some people that follow us that uh, have not been able to find a, because of where they live, there's not a word of faith church or a church that's preaching the uncompromised word. And so they follow us and they listen to us on Sunday mornings and Tuesday nights and they actually tithe to this ministry. Well, God honors that because you're doing your part. But don't 
don't discount your value in prayer and intercession for what we're doing. Because as you know, as I've shared with you, we're reaching thousands of people. And you're a part of that as a partner with us. As a tither, as a giver, as a monthly partner, you become a part of that. Praise the Lord. So, um, getting back to this verse here. I know you think I've gotten way off base. I haven't. Um, getting back to this verse, what he ha is telling us is, I'm delegating to you my power and my authority. Now, I want to read it to you from the Passion Translation, see if you, understand, if you can see that. Meanwhile, the 11 disciples heard the wonderful news from the woman and left for Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had arranged to meet them. The moment they saw him, they worshiped him, but some still had lingering doubts. Then Jesus came close to them and said, all authority of the universe. Now, now that's a more accurate translation. Uh, the word dominion should have been added in there. All authority, all power, all dominion. Those three words are part of the, the original meaning in the Hebrew. Dominion, power, authority. And that's what he's saying here. All authority, all power, dominion of the universe has been given unto me. How far does that a dominion, that authority, that power stretch? It stretches as far as man can go, as far as creation goes. Now, they've tried to put an estimate on how big the universe is. Anything they estimate is wrong in a second. Why? Because the scientists have discovered the universe is still expanding at the speed of light. When God said, light be, light took off. 186,000 miles per second straight out from this point of, of creation. And it's still expanding at that speed. So if they say, well, the, the universe is 48 billion light years across. I don't even know if that's even close. The moment they finished saying it, it was wrong because it's still expanding. And it will expand uh, unless God ever says, light stop. Uh, but I don't think he's going to say that because it affects all light, spiritually and physically. So light be, and light is still expanding. The universe is still expanding. All power, all dominion, and all authority was given to Jesus as he was raised from the dead. He turns around. One of the first things he does, he comes to the disciples, and he now delegates that power, that dominion, that authority back. See, because Adam lost it. That's what Adam had. Dominion, power, and authority over everything God created. Read Psalms 8 and, and of course, Genesis chapter 1. And you'll find that in both places. The psalmist says, What is man that you're so mindful of him that you placed all of your works, all of your handiworks, all of creation, sun, moon, stars, the, the physical elements of this earth, the, the animals, the, the beasts of the field, the, the fish that swim through the sea. What is man that you placed all of that, everything you made, under his feet? See, he recognizes the power, the dominion, the authority that was given to man that Adam lost. But Jesus got it back. What is redemption? It's restoration. God is the God of restoration. To restore, to redeem, to buy back <clears throat> what's been stolen, <clears throat> what's been lost, what's been given away. We're redeemed. Re. When you have an R-E on the front of a word, it's, it's to do again. All right, restore, remake, refashion, uh, rebuild, okay? They have hurricanes in, in certain places, and after a hurricane, they have to come in and rebuild. That means they got to build it new again. Redemption, come, that comes from a couple of words, uh, of course, to redo something. But demption, that part of the word, comes from the word deem. It's an old English word that we don't use anymore. It's what kings used to use. And kings would deem something so, and it became law. It was so. I deem that, and it became. Okay? God deemed light be, and he did it with words, and light was. And he did that for every part of creation. Then he taught Adam how to do that. And what God deemed an animal to be, it became. His words 
caused the nature of that animal to take shape and it became what he said. But then Adam lost all that. But God redeemed what? That we would be restored and paid back for, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> for everything we lost through Adam. Everything God did for man in the beginning belongs to us today. Now, I'm not talking about you living in a garden. I'm not talking about shutting down your house, raising it, you know, so now it's all gone, and turning your property into a garden and going out and living under a tree. But it's the condition, full provision, there's no lack in the garden, no lack of drinking water, juice from uh, fruits, fruits and herbs and things to eat. There was no lack of comfort. The grass, I'm sure, was lush and green, never had to be mowed. <laughs> Adam didn't have to go with the lawnmower through the garden mowing the grass, hallelujah. When God said, uh, guard the garden, that, the, the word that was used there talks about guarding more than it does gardening. <laughs> Adam was not called to garden, he was called to guard, and he let down his garden, let the devil in. But he was called to take the pattern of the garden, full provision, comfort, safety. I mean, when they laid down to sleep at night, man, they were naked. And there were snakes, there were bugs, uh, there were wild animals, the, the, you know, lions, tigers, bears, you name it. And they would lie down to sleep at night and, and never, never even take a thought about the condition uh, that, that was around them because they were in full provision mode. The garden picture is the pattern. As redeemed people, we need to use our faith for the same kind of provision that God did for Adam and Eve. That we have everything we need, more than enough. We're not going to run out of water. We're not going to run out of oxygen. We're not going to run out of food. We're not going to run out of silver and gold. By the way, get ready for it. Things are going to change. We're going to, this country is going to come back on the gold standard. Get ready for it. But we're not going to run out. Pastor Mary and I, we may not know the full picture of, of what's ahead of us. We, we know a step, and we're going to take that step. Financially, we don't know anything more than my God shall supply all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Why? Because we have a garden pattern that God supplied Adam and Eve's needs. They didn't have to worry about if they had enough. And that's what the Lord spoke to me one day when I was asking, what, what does prosperity mean? What does, what does, um, what does it mean to, to prosper? And the Lord spoke to me so simple. He said, when you have enough to never have to think about whether or not you have enough, you're walking in prosperity. I don't know what that figure is, and it would be different for everybody. We don't have, in the natural world sense, we don't have a million dollars put away in the natural, but we do in the spirit, because we've sown more than a million dollars worth of seed in giving and, and, and tithes and offerings and so forth. So on account, on the heavenly books, we're multimillionaires. But I'm not looking at the dollars we have at hand. I'm looking at God's faithfulness. God is a restorer. Everything the devil's stolen from us, God's restoring to us. Every bad choice I've made that caused loss, God's making it up. And because I'm, I'm serving the Lord, God pays, and we see this in the Bible, that God pays good. And I believe he's paying us. So even though there may be a, a dollar amount that we currently have on hand, that's not what we live by. We live by faith because God recompenses and restores. So we believe that as we take our, this next step, we're going to watch God restore financially and bring finances in from unexpected sources. And, uh, you know, there's some of you that support faithfully every month through your tithes and offerings and and your partnership, and, and you don't know how much we appreciate that. But we are not depending on you. We're depending on God. 
And God's using those of you that are supporting because we all are resources for God's work to be accomplished in this earth. So don't feel bad when, when you know, God uses you as a resource. Praise God that you're in a position where you can give and you can sow seed. You know, and then God can bless that back to you. But when we get back to this verse here, and we read it here, now let's, let's go back to verse 19 in the Passion Translation here, Matthew 28. After he says, all power, authority, and dominion in the universe has been given unto me. Verse 19, he says, now go in my authority. Let me, let me expand on that a little bit. Back to the Hebrew. Go in my dominion, my power, my authority. That's what Adam had. That's what God gave Adam. That's what Jesus got when he was raised from the dead. And that's what Jesus gave to the church. He didn't give it to the world. He didn't give it to the sinner. He gave it to his body. And he's telling us, and he told the disciples, go where? Where God calls you to go, what God calls you to do. That's what we're doing. That's what we're endeavoring to do, is be obedient to God's calling upon our lives. And so if I am going and doing what God says, I can expect to operate in the power, in the authority, in the dominion that God gave to Adam and gave back to Jesus, who gave it to us, the church. And if you're obeying God and doing what God is impressing upon you to do, then you can walk in the power, the dominion, and the authority, and through that will come restoration and recompense, which is one of the aspects of the nature of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I hope you're getting something out of this, because I, I am. I mean, if nobody else is getting blessed, I'm getting blessed, praise God. I know Pastor Mary is. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. God restored to man the church, the body of Christ, the dominion, the authority, and the power. It was given originally to mankind through Adam. Now it's given to the church through Jesus and from the church then to the world. But we're the conduits to bring God's plan to the world. We're not being religious trying to condemn people for being other religions. We're, we're trying to love them by the love of God into the kingdom of God so they finally meet the true God, the one and only God, and the one and only Savior of mankind. There aren't multiple saviors. There are not multiple redeemers. There's one. We call him Jesus, Yeshua, okay? Jesus is the redeemer, and he's our Lord and Savior. That's the ultimate redemption right there. Being restored to fellowship with God. Being restored to right standing, which is what the word righteousness means. That we have right standing with God because of what Jesus did for us and because we received the work he did on our behalf. We made him Lord of our lives. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you will believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus as your Lord, you will be saved. If you're not saved today, you're not born again, you don't know if you died, you go to heaven, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Dear God in heaven, say it right now, say it. Dear God in heaven, I make a choice today to believe your word that you raised Jesus from the dead on my behalf. And I make a declaration today, Jesus, be Lord of my life. I receive you as my Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer. Now I declare with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord. And I surrender my life to you, Lord. Take control. Make me a new creation, what you want me to be. Amen. Now that's a simple prayer. It's a prayer of faith, what we call a prayer of faith. And if you prayed that prayer, I want to hear from you. Why don't you send me an email at wemmons01 at gmail.com and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Uh, uh, and you can tell me what date you did it on because you may hear this after the fact. It's still the anointed prayer. And send me an email. Let me know you prayed that prayer. And if you'll do that and remind me, uh, there's a book I want to give you. It's called Welcome to the Family. And if you'll do that and ask for that book, I'll send it to you free of charge. Amen? 
For those of you that are being blessed by this ministry and you want to support this ministry and you feel the Lord has spoken to you or at least is impressing upon you, we welcome you into partnership with us. And those of you that maybe haven't felt that yet, pray about it. We're believing God for a hundred faithful, committed monthly partners because that will give us the ability to continue to move forward and expand and accomplish the things God's put on our hearts. And when you partner with us, that word partner has two things. Part, you become a part of the work we accomplish. And you get credit in the kingdom of God in, the, in, the, in, in heaven itself for everything we accomplish because you partner with us through your giving. If you want to be a partner with us, I'll tell you how you can do that. Uh, we have a PayPal account, it, that email I gave you. W-E-M-M-O-N-S-01 at gmail.com. Uh, you can go on PayPal, type that in, it'll come up. Uh, and on, on the second page, after you enter the amount, second uh, page or option you have is to choose friends and family or not. If you choose friends and family, and you should, that removes the fees they charge, which is 3.8%. Uh, if you forget to do that, they take out 3.8% of what you give. So that's one avenue. We also have a Venmo account. Uh, I'll give you the way to find it, find us direct. At, you go to Venmo, then you type in the at symbol, and it's W-E-M-M-O-N-S. I'm sorry, I'll take that back. It's William, W-I-L-L-I-A-M, capital W, with a dash, and it's M, it's capital E-M-M-O-N-S, another dash, and a 10, one, zero. Okay, so William dash Emmons dash 10, and, and you should see my picture. If you don't see my picture, it's not the right one. You've typed something wrong. But when you see that, you got William dash Emmons dash 10. That should be us. And then you can go ahead and give that way. And uh, those are all tied to our ministry account. It doesn't go in our pocket. It goes into the ministry. And we will pray over you and believe with you for no less than a hundredfold return. And we appreciate every one of our existing partners. Thank you so much for your faithfulness, your commitment, you that are tithing to this ministry. That means a lot to us. And we appreciate that. We believe for the return for the tither. And we believe for the return on those that give beyond your tithe. And we, we praise God for you. We're going to let you go on Instagram. Have a blessed week. We'll be back Tuesday night at 7 o'clock in the same place. And all of you on so Mary, you're going to go ahead. Bye-bye, Instagram. All of you on Facebook, we've gone a while this morning, but I believe there was a lot we needed to share with you, and I believe this exhortation from the Word of God, uh, I believe it's helped you and blessed you, and we thank you for staying with us for the program. Uh, we're going to let you go in a minute. You know how to give. I've already shared everything about giving, and uh, we trust you will be faithful. Even if you're attending another church, you can still partner with us. We partnered with a lot of ministries when, before we were ever in the ministry. We were in another church. We tithed to our church, but we partnered with other ministries and gave beyond our tithe. And we still do that today. We still tithe and give offerings, sow seed into other ministries. So when you give into this ministry, you get credit for giving here, but then we give from the finances that come in into other ministries. Guess what? you get also get credit for what they're accomplishing. That's a two or twice sown seed. And you get credit for both times. Hey, we love you guys. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. We'll be back Tuesday night, 7 o'clock for you guys too. So we're going to let you go. Have a blessed day. And uh, next week, 4th of July, you're going to have a good time then too. Amen? All right, we'll see you then. Oh, we got to shut it off here.